Essential or not essential? That's the question. A new cartoon was not essential since this cartoon really captures the essential use discussion. The cartoon was used earlier in a Camp Connection interview on PFAS, where we placed it in another Shakespeare setting. If PFAS, with all its unique properties, is a Midsummer Night's Dream, or, due to its adverse health effects of PFAS, a nightmare. Today we'll focus on the broader concept of essential use, together with Sylvain Bettin from DJ Environment from the European Commission and Stefan van der Broek of CEFIC. Gentlemen, welcome. Sylvain, the Commission stated that they would consult all corners of society to define what is essential. Is there already some consensus on the definition and what are the considerations? So indeed, we, we consult quite broadly. Uh, we organized a workshop uh, during the, the spring. Uh, it was not a face-to-face -face workshop, but quite popular workshop, what 600 people participate. Uh, and then this was followed up by uh, a survey on all the participants that was complemented by uh, our consultant uh, by specific uh, targeted interview on some of the participants. So all of this uh, input is currently under assessment uh, that will help us to, to define the criteria. So for the time being, we don't have clear criteria. Uh, we are reflecting on them. What I can say already is that um, we want to apply essential uses only to the most harmful chemicals. Uh, not to all chemicals, but only to a specific group, so the most harmful one, harmful one. And then uh, we also have in mind that we mainly uh, use essential uses based on the function of a substance. So for example, we will look at um, how a substance is used in specific product. Is it a pigment? Is that pigment essential for society? We are not looking at uh, do we want to say that toys are essential or not, but it's really the function of a substance in toys, for example. And the pigment is a good example. Perhaps we don't need to have a, a red toys if the red is carcinogen. Clear example. Stephen, who do you think should decide which uses of chemicals are essential and how is industry contributing to the essential use definition? Well, of course, there are two questions uh, you just asked. Now, I will start with the, with the second one. That's the easiest one. How did we contribute? As Sylvain already mentioned, there was a stakeholder workshop. There were a lot of consultations. And of course, we contributed to those. Uh, we submitted information. We submitted ideas. Uh, we have a lot of discussions, we also publish several materials at our website, so that's how we try to contribute to the overall debate. Now, on who is going to decide? Well, I mean, may, let's maybe take a f one step back. I mean, how are we going to do the assessment? In our view, as we see it, um, it will not be, let's say, a very easy assessment. Essential use assessment, in our view, um, it will not be like you have tomorrow some kind of algorithm that will calculate for you is a use essential or not. So it means uh, essential use will always require some kind of judgment. It's more, it's, let's say, a subjective assessment. So it mean, then if you have this in, in mind, then you also need a, a committee. And you, have a, you need a, some kind of body that has the legitimacy to take these kind of decisions that can also be held accountable. So in our view, this debate and the decision should be taken by a separate committee. It's not a technical discussion, it's much more policy. Um, that has a political accountability that also has, a, let's say, includes a broad representation from regulator side, but also from stakeholders and society to have this kind of discussions. And if I briefly may come on, on what, what Sylvain said on, on where the assessment would apply. I understand and we, we have been looking at this already. Is it about the use? Is it about the application? No one wants to start debating, do we need toys? Do we need that? But at the end, in, if you do an essential use assessment, even if you start by looking at the application, what is this chemical doing? Do we need this function? Somehow you will always run into the next question, but what if will happen if a certain use of a certain application will no longer be, be available? It's often, is this essential? Then we get typically the response like, it depends. Where is it being used? For what is being used? So I mean, for me, it's not a clear cut. And there will be difficult discussions. There will be difficult decisions to, to be made. And like I said, therefore you need a separate committee. Okay, talking about that committee, eh? uh, I think it's a suggestion. Are there already similar committees on other topics that are functioning like the way you describe? To my knowledge today, um, not immediately, certainly not in the sphere of the, the chemicals legislation. Uh, you have typically you have more the scientific technical committees. You have committees with representatives from member states. But this broader committee, uh, I haven't seen it yet. I know, for example, in the UK, they are already reflect upon this. They are already looking more into, like, say, this kind of committee or platform where you can have this kind of discussion with a broad representation from different sites and different stakeholders. 
that we believe it's more technical than it's foreseen so far. Uh, we believe that at least some parts are obviously technical, like the analysis of alternative. Uh, so this, we believe that perhaps we can use SEAC. SEAC is well equipped to look at alternatives, so we can continue to, to use SEAC for that specific part. On the critical element of, uh, of the essentiality, um, indeed, perhaps it's a bit more political, but I'm not so sure as well. Um, so there is several options on the table. One of them is to use the member state committee, uh, member state committee, because it's, as you said, representative of, of member states. So it's not like RAC and SIAC. So this is uh, one option. And at the end, uh, it will be the commission that will take uh, the decision. Uh, of course, with the consultation by uh, with the, with the member states. Uh, so uh, most probably the rich committee. So for us, the dec final decision will be done by the commission. No. Thank you for those clarifications. Um, where in the EU are you already applying the concept of essential use? The obvious example is the uh, Montreal Protocol that has been uh, implemented in a regulation in, in the EU uh, for ozone depleting substances. But there is a big difference between the, that group of chemicals with what we want to do in the rich, and not only in rich, but also in all, all chemical legislations. Um, ozone depleting substances are a very narrow group of substances with very narrow uses. So indeed, our starting point is to use uh, the definition of the Morel Protocol, but to see how we have to, to, to amend it, uh, to fit with uh, what we want to do, to have horizontal criteria that fits for all uh, type of chemicals, and not only the one used, uh, I mean, th the one under the scope of the Morel Protocol. Stephen, what are CEFIC's view on implementing the essential use concept? Well, we have been giving it already from the beginning uh, quite some thoughts. Um, and for us, the essential use concept can be some kind of complementary tool to what we are doing today. Because we can understand there are some discussions that are ongoing where you have, you look at the, the, the safety element, you look at the risk element, the socio-economic part. And we can understand that there will be some decisions to be made where you might say, okay, we still have a residual risk. The economic part is, is less clear and that would then also factor in what, how does this chemical and the use of this chemical in the different applications, how essential is for society. Maybe we are willing to accept a certain risk or maybe not. I mean, that for, for us it's more a complementary element, how we can see it, that you could consider to take a decision on chemicals legislation and on, on, on chemicals and whether we allow or not allow certain uses in the future. And what are some of the technical and controversial aspects you identified? The big risk we see with the essential use concept. We see it's, um, I mean, it looks simple at first sight and we see the political attractiveness in that. I mean, who can be against the idea of, of limiting the use of the most harmful chemicals like carcinogens in certain applications to, to the extent to where we really need them? I mean, that's hard, very hard to discuss and to debate about. So the biggest risk we see is that you're, that you're turning upside down the current system. So instead of having legislation and decision making more on scientific evidence and on data, you much go into a more subjective assessment on what do we need as a society. And that's, that's already one, one, let's say, overarching element. And like I said, I mean, it, you can start with a very technical look at it, alternatives, where is it used, what does it do, but then you somehow, someone needs to take a decision, do we still want to keep a certain use? And how are we going to assess what is critical for society? And that's also a bit, and I know it's, it's, the Commission is looking into this. For us today, it's still unclear how we would do that. We have some ideas around it. For us, it's more like you could take it from the angle like, what if a certain use ceased to exist? What would it mean with a set of open questions? What would it mean for Green Deal objectives? What would it mean for climate neutrality, mobility, uh, food supply, and these kind of things? Um, so it's not, like I said before, it's not a straightforward uh, assessment. It's not a tick the box exercise. So that's the, all the elements need to factor in, and that's still for us also a bit unclear where we're going on that side. Yeah, so basically you need a set of criteria which you can weigh each use against. Yeah, I mean, and it's not like, like I said, you have 15 criteria. If you meet 10 of them, you're essential or not. I mean, I don't see how it can work. Maybe we don't see it yet, the full picture, and I can understand people might have a different view on that. But for me, it, it, it's not like a straightforward exercise. It will be much more a debate. And at the end, like I said, I come back on what I said in the beginning. Someone needs to take the decision and to judge and take the final stand. We believe this is essential for, the, for society. Hey, maybe not on all 15 criteria, but is there already some agreement on some of the criteria between authority and industry? We are not yet at this stage because we did not provide uh, 
any uh, clear proposal so far. So we are currently assessing which criteria we want to, to implement. I think there is one that perhaps you can agree on. It's related to the availability of alternatives. But as I said this morning in the, in the conference, this is probably not the most easiest part of, uh, of, the, of the assessment of, of, of essentiality. We have a big issue with alternatives. It's difficult to identify them. So perhaps this is probably the most difficult part compared to the critical part. Uh, I think for critical part, we, we will take into account, um, for example, what is useful to achieve the green, um, the green deal uh, with the climate uh, aspect uh, and so on. So I think this will be part of the critical part. Uh, but we need to define more, more clearly this criteria that we want to use for the critical part um, of the essentiality. And this is not yet uh, on the table. So we are now, as I said, uh, assessing all the input that we receive uh, from the different stakeholders to define which criteria are the most suitable for the, for the essentiality. If I may quickly build upon that, that one. I mean, I'm happy you mentioned, Sylvain, indeed the analysis of alternatives. How are we going to deal with it? Because it's a very difficult exercise. It's often not so straightforward to say there is an alternative or there might be an alternative for certain use, but what about all the other use? So, I mean, a good assessment and an analyze of alternatives uh, will also be important. And I would even say that's not only for the, for the essential use debate. It's, again, it's, we see it also already within the current framework. We need to have, a, let's say, work further on the analyze of alternatives. And, and uh, we, we talk about, it's about availability, economic availability, it's about technical performance. How do we weigh in all these factors to take a decision on whether there is an alternative available or not? And with the essential user base, it, I mean, that gives an, an extra dimension to it, but it's something also to be looked at. Hey, once criteria have been set, eh, uh, they will probably stay in flux eh, because something essential today might not be essential tomorrow. Um, what kind of processes and timelines will be implemented to revisit the decision of something being essential or not? It's, it's more or less the same question as for authorization today. Um, so we, we need to define what will be the period of the review. Five years, 12 years, this is not yet... Uh, but no could, could it be then also similar to authorization that for certain essential uses you have different uh, sunset dates? Yeah, which is not a sunset in essential use, of no, course. No, of but, course. Uh, yeah, it could be an option. Uh, we are now in the impact assess assessment stage. So all of this kind of, um, s it's not small issue, but issue that are, can be, and this kind of decision can be taken during the co-decision. We will make a proposal uh, to be seen exactly what will be the proposal, but this can, uh, can involve during the co-decision. But it will not be part of the impact assessment because it's more case by case uh, assessment that need to be done later on when we'll move to the proper implementation of the, of the essential uses concept. Did the industry have any suggestions on uh, processes and timelines? No, I mean, I would even say one thing we should also, because we typically look at it, we, we look at it something is essential. Today we grant a derogation time limit that we will reassess in 10 years' time. But what will also be intriguing for me is to, to understand how can we do the reverse? Because something might be non-essential today and might be essential in five or 10 years' time. So, I mean, again, Interesting. Yeah, that's that's a completely different look, and, and of course, I don't want to, to overdo the and it's the example of, of the whole situation with the pandemic. But we have seen a few uses where we all agreed two three years ago we don't need these chemicals anymore, and then suddenly they became very important for do, or doing all kind of testing for the vaccination pro, uh, programs. So I mean, that's also how do we factor in that one? So um, I mean, again, and we don't have it completely sorted out, and and I still see all these elements still need somehow to better develop. Um, and then we also come a bit back because it's a, it's a completely new concept. And I know it has been applied in the Montreal Protocol, but it's a completely different set setting as Sylvain mentioned. And also let's keep in mind in the Montreal Protocol, it dates from that uh, protocol, but it has only been used to a very limited extent. Yeah? To a very, let's say, specific uses 30 years ago, and then they found out, oh damn, this is a very difficult discussion. Yeah? And then they start inventing other ways and other concepts. So, before we rush into this new concept and make it a bit as a golden standard to decide on derogations, we would certainly also plea, can we not do a kind of pilot? Can we not do a retrospective analysis? Just to get a bit of better understanding, particularly when criteria are becoming clear, that we can better understand how will it work? Does it work? Do we not run into trouble? Are we not, because it's a whole idea of, of streamlining legislation, do we not run a risk that also that with the essential use we are 
passing on the debate today from safety, socioeconomics, and then just get stuck in an, in an endless essential use debate. So, I mean, how can we avoid it? So, for me, the retrospective analyzers, also, what would it bring compared to what we have done in the past? Would we really come to different outcomes? I mean, that's all still a bit unclear, but of course, before we can do that, we need to progress a bit more on, on how would the essential use criteria look like and how would, would the process be integrated into legislation? Okay, we'll make it a little bit more complex. Besides essential use and non-essential use, some people are suggesting to add a third category, the substitutable use. So roughly defined as a use regarded essential because of their important functions, but where alternatives to the substance have been developed that have equivalent functionality and adequate performance, which makes those uses of the substances no longer essential. Would using this extra substitutable use category facilitate the discussion and decision making? I, personally, I don't believe that we need such a third uh, category because uh, part of the essential uses criteria will be the analysis of alternatives. So if there is an obvious alternative available, then the use uh, will not be seen as essential. So I don't see the need for such an uh, additional uh, category. No. I mean, I, I, I'm, I concur with what Sylvain said. Uh, it's part already somehow of this essential use. Would it really add something? If there are clear alternatives, I mean, it makes sense to look at the alternatives. I would just have one, let's say, a bit more caution. What if you have a broad use, important for society, broad use in society? We have an alternative, but it will mean that uh, the cost of maybe furniture will rise with a factor of two or three. So, I mean, the cost for society will be much higher. So then it's also in the essential use debate, this brings an interesting angle because it's important for society, but we all mean, we all know by pushing it towards the alternative that there will also be an increasing cost for society. So that's also an interesting part. It's already today of the social part of the socioeconomic thinking. It might even become more prominent in the whole essential use debate. Yeah, it could also be around product lifespan for medical devices or airplanes, yeah. those complex uh, products, for instance. Indeed, well, but again, that's a bit, for me, still a question mark. Uh, to what extent are we going to apply the essential use? Are we talking about consumer goods only, or are we also talking about uh, all kinds of industrial applications? Is that, is that a debate? Yeah, for sure, there is a debate on that aspect, uh, that uh, some are saying that uh, it could be enough to apply that concept to, to consumer product. Others are saying, no, I mean, we also need to, to apply to industrial uses. So this is an ongoing discussion that we have also internally. Um, but it will be a focus on sectors of very high concern and for, for the one that we need to act. So can you, can, what, what, what did you say exactly? Do you know that, Stephen? So there is indeed an ongoing discussion uh, internally, but also outside uh, the Commission about how do we want to implement essential uses only for consumer product or also for industrial uses. And what I wanted to say is that first, we agree that we need to implement essential uses only to the substance of concern, so the most harmful chemicals, and also for the one that we, we need to act. Uh, so we will not restrict all uh, substance of concern or the most harmful chemicals in all industrial uses. So perhaps we will act on one specific in industrial uses, and then we have to decide that we want in that specific case to implement the essential uses as is done perhaps currently with PFAS. Final question, could both of you sketch an example of a substance or a group of substances that showcases the complexity of the essential use discussion? Yeah, I mean, I can take, well, two examples maybe. First of all, we look at chromium-6. If I look at chromium-6, the subject authorization and the whole idea of the authorization application of chromium-6 that was also a bit, let's say, the trigger to start rethinking and, and, and initiating the reform of authorization restriction because many applications have been submitted. So for me, it was like how we, I mean, for such a chemical that has so many broad uses, how would you apply this concept? Would you apply the concept and, and to what extent? And then you get this, this, this debate like if you use Chromium 6 to give uh, water taps a shiny look, is that an essential use or not? Yeah? I mean, these are the debates we will be facing. Um, another example that comes across my mind is microplastics. I remember I was in, um, I was in the discussion with on microplastics in, 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 in ECA and RAC SEAC, where we have very long debates on the use of microplastics in um, as infill material for sport pitches. Huh? How are we going to take that one forward within the central use debate? Is it essential or not? If you take a very strict application of essential use, you might say 
there, is, there are some alternatives, much more costly, but okay, there are alternatives. And do we really need to use these artificial sports pitches for society? I mean, and that just shows who is going to take this decision. And if you ask 10 people, you might get the 11 different answers. So that's just one example, a few examples to show, I mean, how difficult it can be. Can I have another example on your side, Sylvain? Yeah, perhaps not an example, because what we believe is that if we move toward the application of uh, uh, essential uses, focusing on the function of, a, of the use of a substance, I think uh, substances have not different type of, of uses. Uh, for example, pigment have very specific uses. So do we need that pigment in consumer product just to have a beautiful color? I would say that perhaps it's not essential to have a carcinogenic pigment in consumer product. So perhaps by focusing on, on, the, on the function of a substance in different uses, we will simplify the concept and if we, perhaps at the end it will not be co as complex as expected. Sylvain and Steven, thank you very much for your contribution in this complex discussion. Essential or not essential, that's the question. I think at least we can conclude that communicating about essential use is essential. Mm -hmm.